This is episode 89 of Changing the Face of Yoga, and Heather Mason is helping me celebrate the second anniversary of Changing the Face of Yoga, and she'll be talking about yoga and trauma and how that's become a trend in yoga today. Let's listen. Hello, and welcome to Change the Face of Yoga, teaching toddlers through golden oldies. I'm very excited to be talking to lots of yoga teachers who will explain their passion for teaching yoga to students with different ages, physical fitness levels, wellness levels, and different goals. They will explain the benefits of yoga for these students and will be including teacher tips and pose modifications. I am Stephanie Cunningham of Yoga Lightness and I've been teaching over 50s for 10 years. So this area is my passion and the passion of many other yoga teachers that you will be listening to in this series. Thank you so much for listening and let's get started. This is Changing the Face of Yoga and Heather Mason is going to be my guest today and I'm really excited about having Heather here. She's extremely knowledgeable about her subject. Uh, She has agreed to be part of my second anniversary theme, which is what are the trends in yoga and how will they look in the future? And Heather is going to talk about yoga and trauma. Uh, I have a lot of popular podcasts about trauma, so it's obviously something that the community wants to know about. Heather has a master's degree, two master's degrees. (laughs) She's a registered yoga teacher at the 500 level and is founder of the Minded Institute, a yoga therapy training school and also the Yoga in Healthcare Alliance. She holds master's degrees in Buddhist studies, in psychotherapy, and in medical physiology. She's been teaching yoga since 2001, and she specializes in the use of yoga therapy for mental health populations, uh, and she's done that since 2007. She's taught at the Boston University School of Medicine and various other academic institutions. Currently, she's actively focused on the integration of yoga into the UK's National Health Service and in 2018 helped to create an all-party parliamentary group, Yoga in Society. We'll have to talk about that because I don't understand what that means. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Heather, and I'm so glad that you agreed to be on the podcast. Is there anything you'd like to add to that introduction? Um, I think that'll do for now. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Um, just, just to say, actually, maybe there's one thing, which is that the reason that I focus on yoga for trauma myself is not just professional, but personal. I'm somebody who is a trauma survivor, and yoga has been instrumental in my healing process, as well as mindfulness meditation. So I just think that that's an important piece of the puzzle, not just my professional qualifications, but that I understand it from an embodied place. Okay, thank you. So you see trauma trainings and trauma discussions and all kinds of stuff about trauma and yoga, uh, what, in the last five years or so. And it's become something that almost everybody thinks they know about. I'm just wondering, given my experience with my podcast where everybody had very different opinions about it, uh, what is your opinion? How did yoga and trauma come together so strongly in the past few years? Well, I would say first and foremost, it's because it's actually, you know, in my estimation, it's been more than five years. And Bessel van der Kolk, was it 2006, I want to say, was engaged in a very small research study and started to show interest in the use of yoga for PTSD. And Bessel van der Kolk is arguably the world leader in trauma and had been for quite a while. There are other fantastic people, but he's a very strong outspoken voice. And I think that because he was behind it, that people perked up and listened. I also think that the trauma community appreciated possibly before other mental health professional communities the vital role of the body in healing. And yoga so nicely fits within that structure because the body is also an area that for many trauma survivors has felt 
there's been a loss of self agency and has been compromised in certain ways. And so the experience of filling back into the body can be a challenge. And, and yoga offers kind of a safe and often structured mechanism. So I think that these are some of the reasons that yoga for trauma became very popular. I also think, I mean, and you can tell me to stop any time, Stephanie, but the appreciation of the diagnosis of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, only came to us in the 1980s. And it was kind of a long time coming. And I think that over the last, I'd like to say 25 years, years since then, society has become more and more interested in embracing this concept and also recognizing, I think, maybe in the last five years, that most of us have probably undergone some traumatic event in our lifetime wherein we react in a way to present moment situations that isn't really relevant or helpful to that present moment. And we've had a lot of wars and vets coming back. And I think all of these things kind of conspire for us to appreciate the prevalence of trauma within our societies. And then when you have outspoken leaders within that field talking about the value of yoga, that all just matches up. And then you arrive at modern day 2019. Is that helpful? It is helpful, yes. So would you say that research has kind of supported and focused the idea that yoga might be helpful in this area or did it come through another way? I definitely think that that is, and that's another piece of the equation. And the research studies that have been done on yoga for PTSD trauma by and large have been very encouraging, not always as rigorous as they should be, not always as large, but the results are encouraging. In 2017, there were a lot of feasibility studies, which means that the research was actually focusing on what will happen if we do this? Will it work? We're starting to see results come out from that now. But you know, in terms of research for mental health conditions, PTSD has much less than, for example, depression or even anxiety and definitely stress. And yet, you, you mentioned it before that everybody has these trainings. I mean, I run a yoga therapy for PTSD training, and it is by far the most popular. It gets booked up very quickly, and we don't have enough spaces. We cannot manage the, de the demand. So I don't think that it's just based on the research, because if that were the case, some of our other courses would have an equal level of interest. There's just something about this area. And the people that are signing up for this course, are they mostly yoga teachers? No, they're yoga teachers. I have quite a lot of psychologists coming, psychotherapists, and more and more also psychiatrists. You know, and I know that this is separate, but my I have a 580 yoga hour yoga therapy training. And interestingly, I've been finding in the last two years that the people who are applying are more and more coming from the mental health and medical communities. So this idea that yoga is helpful in this area has gone out from yoga teachers and our community into the mental health community and how definitely, does, definitely. Yeah, i've had a couple of couple of people who are yoga teachers but also are therapists and they use it in their own work with clients so i'm not surprised to hear that but i am surprised that they're actually coming to trainings and and everything Perhaps not, yeah. you know, realizing that they may not know as much in that particular area as they'd like to. So that's great. I really like that. So if you are going to talk about PTSD to yoga teachers, what do you think is the three things that is most important for them to know? God, that's a toughie. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really a list kind of gal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do it anyway. Can, What's the paragraph you'd say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, by the way, if I, if I mentioned or if you mentioned in my bio, because it was a bit extensive, but with my um, co editor, Kelly Birch, we recently published a book, Yoga for Mental Health, where all the chapters are co-authored by leaders 
in working with different conditions. And uh, we have a great chapter there on yoga for trauma. It's not written by myself or Kelly. It's written by um, Daniel Libby and Dana Moore. And that chapter is just fantastic. It, it has a lot of new stuff in it. But if I wanted teachers to know something about PTSD, what would I want them to know? What would I want them to understand? It's a really great question. I would want them, this is just me, and this is very personal to me. I would want them to understand that when they language a class, that they should always provide room for people's experience. Because many people are not enjoying what they're going through physically or mentally in a class. And I think a lot of yoga teachers talk about the feeling of joy and light that people are experiencing. And not just with PTSD, but the preponderance of people showing up in classes from surveys that we have conducted in different countries. We know people have mental health conditions and they're struggling through all of that. They're struggling through the warrior two. They're struggling through COBRA. Their mind is battling with them. And I find it so much more useful to use cues like, and notice what is arising right now and be interested in it rather than telling people what they're likely to feel. At the same time, when you're working with a population who has acute PTSD, they will have a tendency to be disembodied. And so offering cues around what they might feel in a particular pose to give them a focal point is very helpful. Like for example, if they're in a forward bend, as you're in the forward bend, you may notice a pulling behind your legs. That's because when you bend forward, there's pulling on your hamstrings. However, if you feel something else or something different, be interested in that. We all have our unique experience. So I think the languaging is very important on both counts. Another thing that I would say, which obviously I think is very well understood now increasingly by the yoga community, is always ask before you touch somebody. And then I would say there's this big movement towards making yoga trauma sensitive, which is very important. But yoga can be much more than trauma sensitive. Because of yoga's significant impact on the autonomic nervous system and the autonomic dysregulation that presents with PTSD, yoga can be used as a form of treatment. And I'm not saying it should be used as a standalone treatment, but it can be more than just sensitive. It can be targeted. It can be used in what the book that um, I co-edited with Kelly, Dana, and Daniel called Trauma-Focused Yoga Therapy. And I think that's one of its greatest offerings. But to do that, teachers need to do more extensive training. It, I'm sorry, that was so much longer. That I told you I don't do bullet points, I'm too verbose. But, they, but I don't like just, I don't like quick fixes because they don't work. So I'm, yeah, I have a lot to say, sorry. But that's why I asked you on, so that's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. um, so this is my concern and perhaps it's, an invalid concern, which is like I said, I have these podcasts. Everybody had a different way of looking at it. Everybody, you know, some were into restorative, some were into more physical ones who wanted to get into their body. Some were, you know, putting it with therapy and they were trained therapists. So they were obviously able to do that. But I'm concerned about a yoga teacher who may have taken a weekend workshop and are they getting enough to at least not harm anyone who may have PTSD or may have is experiencing issues with trauma? That's so hard for me to say because I would have to know what is being taught in that weekend. I'm going to come back to what you said before that, which is one person said restorative and one said something more challenging. And the reality is that when you work with PTSD, you have to have the flexibility to understand what people are presenting with, whether it's a group of individuals, and then it's much more difficult because you have to somehow hit the central nexus point that's going to work for the collective or for individuals. And restorative has its benefit in letting the body deeply rest, and it has its drawback in that somebody is uh, possibly their mind is running, possibly they feel very vulnerable. Moving intensely can allow the body to feel empowered. People might not feel that they can follow, might not be physically able to do that. Like Every different style of yoga 
can be appropriate for somebody with PTSD depending upon the stage that they're in their, and what's going on with their body and, and their proclivities. Can a weekend workshop really provide somebody with what they need to know? It's so hard to say, but I always believe that having more extensive training is better. I mean, I do a five-day training in yoga therapy for PTSD, which in of itself I think is not that long, but I think we give a very good overview and we talk much less about style and much more about principles of practice. But without a doubt, our yoga therapists that do, you know, two years with us, I think that they're best prepared to work with mm-hmm. PTSD. So given that there's going to be a wide variety of needs within a class of people who, I, I'm trying to remember the, the figures they've told me before, but I think it's something like 20% of a class will have trauma issues. I mean, we all probably have some trauma in our lives, but, but uh, people that are really actively dealing with it. So I'm just wondering about, I liked what you had to say, you know, no touch language is very important and those kinds of things. Are those enough for just a general yoga teacher to, to deal with people in her or his class that have trauma? Not if they get triggered, and that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, in a general class, probably yes, I would hope so. I think 20% is probably an overestimation. And I I would have to disagree with that statistic. I think that you would probably have less than that unless you're advertising for mental health populations or you're known for that. So that's one thing that I I just want to say for yoga teachers because it doesn't align with the statistics in the population or the surveys that I've seen in the US or the UK. But in terms of the other thing, I think it would be really brilliant if all yoga teacher trainings had a component where training yoga teachers learned what to do if somebody got triggered. And we could just say that trigger is a response being overwhelmed and isn't unique only to PTSD. If teachers also had that training, then yes, I think that they could probably manage. Okay. That's what I'm concerned about. (laughs) I took my training in 2007 and then mm-hmm. another one in 2012. And I don't believe that trauma came up in either one of those. So at that point, at least in this country, it was not an issue. And mm-hmm. so I'm just trying to say, yes, I know this is really important and it's really come up and there's a lot more research and a lot more talk about it. But how many of us have actually, without going to a specific trauma type yoga training, do we really know enough? And I'm just trying to get a baseline, shall we say, of what yeah. people should be look should know about trauma that people may come into their class, a general class that you just, you know, give every Tuesday or something. <laughs> and what can they what should they have that hopefully will not cause a trigger? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, the languaging is very important and the no touching is very important, but you can't really prevent somebody from getting triggered because they're in their bodies, they're dealing with the stuff going in there throughout their minds, and and that's just going to happen. I think that, I don't know if every yoga teacher training needs to have a trauma component. I think what they need to have is a mental health component and what to do if somebody gets emotionally overwhelmed and have a skill base. I think that that's very important. Because when you talk about the preponderance of people in classes that have mental health issues, it's higher than the population at large, and that is vital. And if that was available, I do a one-day course in the UK sometimes, and I can teach some of those skills in an afternoon. I mean, it's not ideal, but some, you know, sometimes that's all people will sign up for, and I prefer they did something than nothing at all. But you can teach skills to individuals that they can learn to deal with triggers in a few hours. And I do a mental health overall day in eight. It's short, but it's something. It's a start. Mm-hmm. And when you're talking about a 200-hour training, eight hours, you know, is a percentage. It's almost 5% of the course then. True. But it sounds like it may, the <clears throat> students that we would have may, may be more than 5% of the class, too. That's true. And yoga was always about mental development, so it wouldn't be a problem. You know, 
still is. Maybe not for everybody, but that was its original purpose. I don't think any yogi would disagree with that. So, so yeah, I mean, it needs, it needs its proper time within the training courses. Mm-hmm. Okay. If we have, we know kind of where we are now in that it has become, people are much more aware of it. People are understanding that, you know, not touching. Uh, I will say I, I was trained in my, <laughs> in my classes to do uh, adjustments. And I've seen posts like recently about adjustment workshops and stuff. So I think, you know, adjustments are, can be done, but you have to be very careful, shall we say, <laughs> with them. Um, mm-hmm. So how, do you see a change going on in the, in the overall yoga community to really be much more open and educated, shall we say, on trauma kinds of issues? Mm, that's such a good question. I mean, sometimes I think I live in a bubble. Remember that in the UK, I'm like really well known for that, for yoga for mental health. And so I might not have a realistic perspective of what happens at large because everybody comes to me for that reason. But what I definitely see is this overall growing interest by the mental health profession. I feel like if a yoga teacher wants to train in yoga therapy for mental health, there's a high likelihood they're going to come to me in the UK. And so it's hard for me to say what people not coming to me are doing. Like maybe who's, there are more people that are not interested in this kind of stuff. But I, I think that there's that emergence. And certainly like all the stuff with the Me Too movement as well kind of came together at the same time. So the whole idea around touch and certain yoga teachers being called out for inappropriate touch, I think has created a burgeoning awareness actually. Mm-hmm. And I think I don't have a problem with adjustments, by the way, Stephanie. I, I think that they can be great, even for people with trauma. And I know that there are people in the trauma community that would ardently disagree with me. But I just think it's about getting permission and getting permission from somebody who actually knows if they're okay with being touched or not touched. Like they have enough awareness to make an informed decision about their body. And, and that really should go for anything beyond trauma. Like I have a hamstring injury. If I'm in down dog and the teacher's behind me in class, I, I have this nervous feeling because I'm afraid they might adjust without asking me for my, you know, asking my permission and they're going to cause me injury. So just from that perspective, it's intelligent to ask. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, so let's, let's go with the second part of the question, which is, we're at this point, it's become a much more uh, discussed and knowledgeable part of, of yoga for some people. Where is it going to be in 10 years? And that obviously is your guess. <laughs> Where is it going to be in 10 years? Well, I think that we're going to find that yoga is more and more in integrated into the mental health services. And I think that we're going to find, I mean, the U.S. and the U.K. are obviously very different. And even though I'm American with this American accent, I haven't lived there for a very long time. And the difference between healthcare systems will inform how things manifest. But I can say at least here, I think we're going to find that in a lot of trauma-based treatments available in the National Health Service, people are going to be either offered yoga therapy or yoga is going to be a part of what mental health professionals are aware of. I think in addition that yoga teachers will be increasingly aware of the value of yoga for mental health and best practice, and that will be informed by an increasing body of research. The fact that the market is saturated and people need to do things to differentiate themselves And also the growing awareness that yoga's greatest value is probably in mental health, not to underestimate its value in other things like muscular skeletal conditions, neurodegenerative, chronic pain, inflammatory, et cetera. But if that's the case, that mental health continuously is being demonstrated as the most effective, I think we're going to see just a flourishing of classes for people with mental health and trauma. And I also think that the stigma is increasingly dying, even though it's present, because 
so many of us are struggling with our mental health and we're speaking out more, which means that our willingness to go to classes focused on mental health conditions is increasing. So I just think it's going to be this upward spiral that's going to take off at such a massive level in the next 10 years. And with the advent of things, you know, online things, there's going to be so many technologies available that people will be able to use as well. Will they learn yoga skills in the comfort of their own home? Okay. <laughs> I had a great question. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Should I give you shorter answers? <laughs> it's all right. I guess um, this is a question, but we'll go with it. The stigma is a realistic issue, though, isn't it, about how to find help but be – your identity is protected or at least you're you're not feeling like you're being exploited and and i i just wonder how you can bring people into a class when you really may not want to say this is for mental health you can call it stress relief you know stress is actually i'm super stressed it's a sign of how hard you work it's like a banner of honor people wear a badge of honor not a banner of honor a badge of honor you know but I think that we need to, as a yoga community, not be afraid to say depression, anxiety, PTSD, like these kinds of things at the same time. Mm. You know, in 2007, I developed an eight-week course, Yoga Therapy for Depression and Anxiety. I don't teach it anymore, but my students do. But when I taught it, it was always full. And it's been a long time since I've had. I think we underestimate how desperate people can feel and their willingness to show up even despite the stigma. But yeah, just call it stress if all else fails. Stress, burnout. Okay, great. Overcoming your fears. Everybody wants to overcome their fears. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You're saying that you think that yoga, especially in the mental health area, will become part of, at least in, in the UK, the, the health system. Mm hmm I do. Oh, I am also an American, although I, tend, I live in Australia. So I, I, see, I see the difference in the medical systems as do you. Do you think that mm -hmm. there's anything, that this being integrated into the medical system in the UK will then therefore travel <laughs> to other countries like the US? I Australia is kind of in between there somewhere. I don't, I'm not part of their system, and so I don't quite know as, as much about it as I probably should. But how do we get it into other countries also? Do you have some thoughts on that? Well, I think that the countries that are, it's going to be easiest to adopt it are those where the government pays for health care because policymakers will have a vested interest in finding a low-cost solution that promotes um patient empowerment and self-efficacy. I think that the UK is in a position to potentially lead the charge. India is making big headway right now with Ayush in terms of their plans, and we'll see how that all pans out. But I do think that the most successful countries will likely export their ideas to other nations and they will adopt it. But when you talk about countries where individuals pay for health insurance, it's going to be interesting how that manifests. I mean, the U.S. already has an example, right? Because Medicaid and Medicare pay for the Ornish program, of which yoga is one of the components. And the three other components are all kind of informed by yoga. So that's actually happening, even in a system where people pay for health insurance. But I guess whoever kind of locks it down <laughs> will be the beacon for the rest of the world. You know, I think the U.K. potentially could do it. India as the origin of yoga and with a ministry devoted to it, maybe the nation to do it. And so far, Sweden is the most successful country to integrate yoga into the health services. So we'll see. But it, you know, it's a... Well, it, it's, yeah. It, the, the government the pays for it. It's one, it's one place that you have to convince instead of all those different insurance companies. So I can, I can see that. So you said that you are, and I love this term, you are you started the parliamentary group yoga in society is this is the point of that to start bringing yoga into 
your society yeah. <laughs> or, or into the medical health system <laughs> one or the other yeah so so just to clarify i didn't create the group um i'm the secretariat of the group oh. but i worked with a uh, a lord who doesn't always like to be named but yeah. he did fantastic work to help to create this group in the beginning of 2018 and the idea, my interest is in yoga within healthcare in general. His interest in is yoga in four different pillars, which is healthcare, occupational health, education, and criminal justice. Mm. So we have different people in this country who are working to get yoga into all those different avenues, and we collaborate towards that end. But it's a slow burn, and right now the UK, as I'm sure you're aware, has pretty big fish to fry in government mm. that supersede these kinds of issues. Although, with all of the havoc around Brexit, people need yoga, in my opinion, more than ever, especially the parliamentarians themselves. And it sounds very stressful over there, and that it, for parliamentarians. Um, okay, yeah. so so this basically. I mean, you've already started on making it part of healthcare at the political level with this particular parliamentary group. Is that a fair statement? Possibly. What, what, I hope. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying. We're trying. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I'm going to ask you if there's anything that you would like to add at, right now that we haven't discussed that you think it's important for the listeners to know about yoga and trauma. I would just say, and this is probably not where you think I would go, Stephanie, so it, I, I hope it's okay. <laughs> there are so many yoga teachers out there who are still suffering with their mental health, with PTSD, with a past of having trauma, and don't pretend. Don't sit there and hide that so you can be this perfect guru light that you imagine you need to be to help others. It will only delay your own healing process. And it will create false expectations for those who teach. Be your, your authentic, real self. That's what I would say. It's okay to not be perfect because nobody is. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's yeah. probably one of the most important things you've said. Heather, if you'd like to contact Heather, as, you, as she's mentioned a couple of times, she has lots and lots of courses in this area. Uh, some may be online. So if you'd like to contact her. She, her website is www.themindedinstitute.com. That's all one word. And she, her social media links, her fa Facebook is at Yoga Mind. And <laughs> I think that's Twitter. That's Twitter. Oh, Yoga it, Mind. Oh, Twitter. Oh, okay, that's Twitter. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I don't see Facebook. Okay. Um, Facebook is um, Yoga Therapy for the Mind at, the, at Minded. Okay, yoga therapy for the mind at Minded. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's Facebook. Then we did Twitter, and her email is heather.f.mason at gmail.com. So if you have a desire to contact Heather about what we've talked about or about other things or what she can offer, as you can tell, she's extremely knowledgeable and pretty much an expert in this field. So Heather, I really want to thank you. I think it's been a really fascinating uh, podcast. And like you said, it didn't go like I thought it would, which is always, <laughs> a, sign. It's always a sign of a good podcast. <laughs> when we go out and talk about really good things. So thank you so much. And is there anything you'd like to end with? Just thank you, Stephanie. And I wish you a pleasant day and um, take good care. Namaste. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful interview. If you would like to be a guest on Changing the Face of Yoga, please go to my website, www.yogalightness.com.au and under the Changing the Face of Yoga tab, you can complete Be Our Guest form. After reviewing the form and finding it applicable to this podcast, we will send you a link to schedule an interview. Please download, review, 
and tell your friends of any podcasts that are of interest to you and to them. If you would like to contact me, send an email to info at yogalightness.com.au. And thank you for listening to Changing the Face of Yoga.